Hello, I am Jamie, aka Brandoff, the off-brand Gandalf, and today I'm going to show you how easy it is to do a random scenario for the Fist RPG. Uh, now, I love to do random scenarios. I run a ton of one-shots, so a nice, focused, fun little adventure is one of my favorite things. And uh, one of the things that first drew me to Fist is the fact that not only does it come with an example scenario, it comes with this cool random mission generator, all in like a little 50-page book, uh, which is, I mean, it's kind of amazing if you think about it. A lot of 300-page RPGs out there don't come with an example scenario in the book. Uh, D&D 5th edition, I'm looking at you. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's what we're, we're doing today. Uh, I've got my, my little word document here. Um, now I'm going into this blind. I don't have any ideas half the time, to be honest, half the time when I set out to roll up a random adventure, I wind up getting inspired by a favorite movie of mine and just veering off and doing that at the very least rolling up a random adventure is sort of like a writing prompt uh, or a writing exercise that just kind of primes your author side of your brain so even if you don't wind up using the uh, material that you roll it can help you come up with an adventure but to keep things interesting, I am going to force myself to obey the rolls. Uh, I'm not even going to allow myself to re-roll, which, for the record, is something you should always do. Never feel that you have to uh, honor the random rolls. It's all for inspiration. But this is just kind of like a, like a fun little exercise for myself. What can I come up with keeping my initial rolls? Now, the one thing I can't think, quite figure out how to do is get my rolls on screen. I suppose I could open up like a a new like a Google Dice window or something. But you're just going to have to trust me. This is the honor system. So uh, you'll find this mission generator. I'm using uh, the Fist, the uh, second revision, which is the version you can purchase on Itch.io and Exalted Funeral and drive Through RPG. I know Claymore, the author, is working on the new Fist Ultra version, and she has told me that that will have some expanded mission generation stuff, which I'm super looking forward to. Uh, but no, right now we're just using the on-the-market Fist 2nd Edition. We're going to roll 4d6 to deploy. Two. An evil mega corporation. Ooh, always a good one. An evil mega corporation. What are these scallywags up to? That's a four. Mutate humans or animals. I love it. So right here, I'm thinking there is a, a fist is of course set during the Cold War era, and although that stretches quite a few decades, I tend to focus on the 80s for my uh, scenarios. And let me tell you, there were a ton of movies with this particular setup in the 80s, uh, usually inspired by Alien, I'd say. Um, there were a lot of like, let's rent an office building downtown and throw some B, D-list actors in lab coats and we'll experiment on animals and you know, no doubt one of the doctors winds up injecting himself. Uh, the worst example of that setup I can think of is probably Shockma, which is a uh, a killer, I believe, baboon movie. It's it's so, it's just the worst. Don't watch Shockma. It will make you feel sorry for the the primate actor who is constantly thwarted by doors. You just have to close a door, and he can't get through. Uh, it's a feel-bad experience. Let's move on. Six, which will unleash an unfathomable eldritch horror. It would be much easier just for me to copy these lines. 
But uh, no, the brand off difference is you get to see me type everything out and make typos. But three, a late historical figure is somehow alive and involved. Oh, and there's a twist. Let's find out what that twist is right now. Wait, I didn't decide which table to roll on. Uh, I will uh, randomly decide what table to re-roll. That's a four. So we're going to re-roll the, <laughs> the uh, late historical figure table for the twist. Their plan is likely to spiral out of control at any minute. Okay, that's interesting. I do really like the combination and contrast of an eagle, evil <laughs> an eagle, an evil mega corporation with eldritch horrors. Uh, it kind of reminds me of the the writing of uh, a weird lit author named Laird Baron, who kind of fluctuates between like nineteen twenties pulp two fisted detectives who are way in over their head versus some kind of uh, mythos or cosmic entity. And the other side of the coin that he tends to write is modern day, kind of like like businessmen, like like really high echelon security experts and stuff, like dudes who fly around in private jets, and and they also wind up uh, inevitably going up against something cosmic. So I could definitely get some some inspiration from from that. Uh, but let's just look this over. Do, 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 do. Okay, now uh, we'll just say this is a one shot. Um, I I like to to tell folks that you can boil one shots down to three scenes, and of course, it always helps to over plan, and I always over plan. But uh, you know, if you have more than just a couple of players. They're all going to be interacting with the world and talking to each other and figuring stuff out. I think three good solid scenes are really all you need. So um, now also with, with, with one shots, I prefer to skip the, the briefing period. Um, I, I, I'm actually in a really cool play by post game right now that does have a briefing period, but that's, you know, asynchronous. There's plenty of time. There's no time limit. That totally works when you're at the table or on discord and you have two or three hours. Uh, just in my experience, I like to just be like, okay, here's, you know, I kind of narrate the mission briefing and then I'm like, you're on scene or you're in route. Uh, how would you like to approach the situation? Rather than have like people, you know, like in a meeting room somewhere. Um, although that that can be a great scene. Uh, so we're just going to have scene one. I'd like to do. Uh, they're, they're approaching the mega corporation, and what could make this feel ominous? Um, okay, I think. What if there was like. Uh, well, I mean, we need it. We need a city. Um, I recently saw Howard the Duck. Let's go with Cleveland. If that's how you spell, I don't think that's how you spell Cleveland. Help me. Um, let's say that there is a citywide blackout, like the corporation just kind of drained all the power from the city. Uh, uh, the the skyscraper stands alone in an otherwise stands as an ominous shining beacon alone in an otherwise black dark city. I think that's a pretty good visual. Um now if you if you did have some more time you could have uh, maybe like a fun little encounter with uh, maybe they pass by. If you have a particularly heroic group of players, they could do. I'll just throw in some like optional muggings, looters, um, mohawk. 
punk dudes, uh, whatever. If you have like particularly heroic fist mercenaries, uh, this is not monster of the week though. No one in fist is, is really required to stop street crime. They have bigger fish to fry, but if you needed to, I like to have a few just like optional little things just in case. Uh, now, one thing I include with every uh, one shot I run is there's a there's a great little paragraph of example uh, creating standard enemies. Uh, <clears throat> I have based almost all my almost all my enemies on just this brief list right right here. Um, I'm a firm believer in as far as monster design that less is is more. And that uh, as, a, as a player or as a GM, I think it's it's better to keep enemy stat blocks short and give them really interesting, flashy, memorable, impactful abilities. And not worry about like, you know, whether or not they are proficient in fiddling or something like that. Like it, it doesn't matter. Uh, so so Fist is is quite good. And there's um there's been a couple of, of bestiaries since then. One of the um, I believe Ripley just released a uh, a plant themed bestiary, which I haven't got to look at too much yet. But anyway, point is, I always like to keep this at the bottom of my uh, my missions, and you just copy right out of the book. And like right here, like let's say there was a civilian who was being attacked by some ne'er do wells on the street. Uh, you could stat the civilians as just civilians and maybe the robbers as soldiers or civilians themselves. It doesn't really matter. Uh, but that's just an example of how if you do anticipate you have more time or your players seem to like really enjoy like the visual of just them rolling through this black and city, you can just uh, throw in some more content. You know, it helps to kind of listen to player reaction. Uh, scene two this will be their uh sort of like as they climb their way up the building i find you don't have to do too much description for for like don't i try not to go on too long like if you say a, like a corporate lobby with a security desk in the the middle of the room and some some chairs and weird corporate art in the walls. I think that that usually paints a good enough picture and you don't need to go overboard. So we could just have a few rooms here. Lobby, uh, security desk, cheap corporate art. Uh, just for a little tactical stuff, you could have um, headless bronze statues, replicas, and um, yeah. Uh, how will they make their ascent? Uh, there are elevators. Uh, there's a security board. Big clunky security cameras and poison gas. A stairs would be a good place to show something weird is going on. Um, maybe there's a, a river of Ooze. Uh, let's make it a little bit gross. It's not like ooze flowing down downstairs. Uh, let's see here. What kind of environmental hazard could be? I think maybe like uh, twisted. Uh, this is a word for this, not proboscis, but like tw it's like like tentacle hands. Yeah, I'll just go with that. Tentacle hands reach up to twist ankles and knock folks downstairs. And then for these, uh, you could either treat these um, treat these little grasping hands as an enemy or as more of a hazard to be avoided. Uh, that's totally up to you. I kind of like the idea of, of treating them as an enemy just for the, the visual 
of like, you know, if, if somebody only rolls one damage and like the hand gets kind of partially blasted apart, I would go for uh, probably lower damage just for this. Um, um, bum, 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 bum. Nah, never mind. So as I look back, uh, the the first scene, I think it does need some more. Um, what if instead of, you know, there's no telling that the party's actually going to interface with any of this kind of street crimes type stuff. Like they're not Batman. Uh, so there could be, yeah, I, th- I like the idea of like fleeing employees. Um, and what might make this more interesting is if we have, okay, let's get this out of the way here. The approach. Uh, scientists, scientists flee the building shot in the back by a squad of security, by a security team. I like that better. That invites uh, the party to act. It's directly uh, connected to the plot. They're going to want to try and save these scientists to figure out what's going on. Um, and then down here, of course, we have the stat block. Uh, you could do uh, heavy troopers, or you could just save those dudes for later. I kind of like this block right here. So security guards. Gimme. And just to make it difficult, let's say there's five of them. Holy cats. Whoa, no. So that's going to start with like a big burst of combat, which is a nice way to kick off an adventure. How many scientists? I'm going to go with six. Uh, The guards prioritize killing the scientists above fist until they're fired upon. Uh, The scientists can tell fist what's going on and then what is going on uh, mega corp is trying to let's go back up here what are they trying to do unleash an unfathomable eldritch horror i am totally drawing a blank on this historical figure uh, having just seen Howard the Duck, I am tempted to make it some kind of interdimensional laser. Okay, so uh, one thing I like to do when I'm actually typing up adventures is I have first the mission briefing, which is what like the party is is you're basically like reader odd text, like give this to them, and then I have the backstory GM eyes only. Uh, here would be like a good place to put like what's really going on. Another way to do it would do would be like a a Sly Flourish style secrets and clues bullet points. Uh, any way you want to do it is fine. Just make sure, especially if you're going to publish, that you put like the full backstory up front. Like, don't keep things a secret from a GM who's trying to run the adventure. That would be a funny reason. To unleash a cosmic horror. I think, you know what? Uh, let's go with something uh, 80s-ish. Okay, for one, we need a name for the Megacorp. Cleveland Megacorp. There we go. It's trying to unleash a cosmic horror. Um, uh, yeah, I kind of like this as a, just like a form of, of corporate espionage. Uh, in exchange for exchange the horrors cultists will uh, assassinate um, rival company CEOs. Yeah, sure, that works. Uh, You can't possibly blame the corporation when a bunch of crazy cultists go around uh, executing all their uh, rivals. And hey, you know, it's it's just an an elder god. 
Uh, what do they care if it's uh, unleashed into the world? Mutate humans or animals? Uh, da, 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 da. The cosmic entity needs a perfect vessel uh, in the form of a, a mutated human capable of containing its unfathomable um, stuff. <laughs> uh, don't worry too much if these notes are for yourself. You'll get it. Uh, CMC's security teams have been abducting homeless and uh, other vulnerable peoples to experiment in their secret lab on the 13th floor in my uh, artifacts and adventure i talk about i have both the laws of npcs and then i have go for the gold which is goal obstacle location and deadline which was inspired by a combination of icrpg and professor gm kind of smushed together this is something i always have trouble remembering to do is the deadline the ticking clock, the race against time. Uh, it seems like such an optional thing, like maybe not necessary, but it really makes a difference. And at some point in, in, in an adventure that lacks a deadline, you're going to have like a player pitch like, well, why don't we just go and invest in a company for three years and then get a vast fortune and then buy the gmc or something like that you know and like <laughs> it helps to immediately have a reason why that doesn't work because you don't want to be stuck like trying to shut down an otherwise good idea so um tonight so i'd like to say that tonight it was a success uh tonight it was a success cmc a siphon power from the city for a as part of the summoning ritual in, I'll say, two hours, the cosmic horror will fully cross the threshold into our world. That works. Go to the CMC headquarters and stop whatever's. Uh, and then I, I think I'll say it's getting worse by the second. There you go. There's your title of it. Um, stop whatever's happening before it's too late. That's a perfectly good little briefing there. Uh, first, there was a string of mysterious kidnappings in the area. Then an hour ago, they drained the power from the surrounding city. And people are going wild as if under the influence of some dark entity. I love that kind of thing, by the way. It's very like in the mouth of madness or shadow builder, which is a deep cut. Um, yeah, there you go. So this is what the players have told in the briefing. This is what's actually happening. And, um, of course, feel free to like kind of chop up these bits and disseminate it to the players throughout the adventure. Maybe the scientists will just let them know the whole thing. If you're in, if you have players who more of enjoy really digging into a mystery, if you have, uh, if you know you have like a hacker, you could hide some of this info, this backstory info, like in computer files. If you have a, a character who's more of a face, who's going to want to like inter talk to people. Uh, maybe bring one of the scientists along. You can make it more personal. Uh, how you get the backstory to your players doesn't really matter. Um, just maybe try to. And like I, I found that like even if your players don't seem all that interested in what's really going on, sometimes like after you've run the scenario, they'll be like, "So hey, what was going on?" And 
or or another thing that could happen is like they just maybe throughout their actions they never found the computer maybe all the scientists get killed maybe they just didn't get a chance to learn anything i think it can help to have kind of an in-game explanation you know there's always the villain monologue there's always like a, like a view screen comes on the wall and some like head scientist taunts them. And speaking of a head scientist, we should talk about some NPCs. You know, rule of three, try coming up with, with three major NPCs, uh, an ally, a henchman, and a boss at the very, at the very least. Uh, I give, I try to give people to someone to talk to in, in every scenario um, so an ally could be one of the scientists, uh, doctor. Now when coming up with, with names, one of the things I like to do is just look up famous people from that area. Like I've, like, I've looked up like famous baseball players from a region. I don't even watch baseball, but like, it kind of gives you an idea of like what an authentic name from that region would sound like. Just mix up someone's first name with someone else's last name and there you go like for instance there is a, a in, in cleveland i'm looking at the list of famous people from cleveland there was a newton d baker a mayor and secretary of war newton is a damn fine name it's likable i think very sciencey uh so there was also da, 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 da. bennett Haley bennett an actress newton bennett dr newton bennett uh maybe she's a younger doctor 27 um now uh when designing npcs i have the laws of npcs try to come up with what the npcs how they look how they act what they want and optionally if they have a secret so dr newton bennett she looks um frizzy 80s uh hair is a must big honking reading glasses is a must but i would like to make her interesting maybe a little bit more than just like a like a like a passive info dumper and again i just seen howard the duck so um yeah clunky laser weapon uh so you know maybe cleveland megacorp was working on some like laser drilling facility or something and she just like picked this up on the way out it's not really uh let's let's say it's a drill she is not uh not one to part with it how does she act personality table and i'm not trying to plug uh my game or anything any list of you can find these kind of like personality tables anywhere uh this is just what i'm using because i have it on hand and I, i'm sure there's going to be something like this um just about anywhere you look but since i already have it written up five and or two and five so she's deceitful and devious ouch okay uh what if those were switched professional but i did say i was gonna let the dice fall maybe dr newton bennett isn't as nice as i thought she was maybe dr newton bennett has been behind it all maybe she ran out there to Ooh, maybe she ran out there with the security team with the laser intending to just like mow down the fleeing scientists but then she saw a fist show up and like instantly flipped and was like, uh, help stop the uh, security guard, save me. And is now going to kind of like bide her time until she can betray an attack with that 2D6 laser. Yeah. So I think she is deceitful and devious. I'm just gonna go with both, whatever. Technically you could do one or the other, but I kind of like both. Deceitful, devious. Of course, if someone's like deceitful and devious, that's not like a surface level. The whole, like the kind of the point of how they act uh, to me is to tell DMs how to portray them. And of course, if someone's deceitful and devious, that's 
unless you're like a, a Disney villain, then you talk like this. It's going to be kind of a surprise. So she needs like a personality trait that's more immediate. 14. Blunt. Okay, I like that. Blunt. Blunt. And then in parentheses, because typically uh, if it's for GM size only kind of stuff, I do parentheses and uh, italics. So that's that's pretty good. She, she's blunt. And she's also deceitful and devious. Uh, what does she want? Well, I think we we kind of uh, figured that out already. To to stop fist from to stop fist from halting the the bargain. As, as cool as it, as it is to have villains like want to stop the the players, it, it can also be good to have them want something involving the players or the PCs. Uh, what might be interesting is if you could like look over the traits of your players, and if anyone's got something like supernatural, or like like they're they've got seal or something that would kind of lend itself to a demonic or cosmic summoning. Maybe Dr. Newton Bennett recognizes like the fist team member and like, she needs to like personally, she needs to get them into the room. Maybe they're, they're, they're mutant. Uh, the person that they've mutated to act is kind of like a, uh, a vessel isn't working out or maybe she sees that this this fist member could be a superior vessel so she's going to kind of like tag along and pretend to be an ally just to get them into that final room hell maybe she just wants to make sure that the cosmic horror has a nice snack when it gets here yeah um wants to to herd fist into the summoning room as either a snack or alternate Vessel, secret, see above, she's evil. Yeah, there you go. Uh, so that's interesting because <clears throat> Newton will double as both an ally and the, the, the villain. Uh, I, I also, I almost always include like an interesting uh, security, lead security guard dude. And of course, Fist was inspired by Metal Gear Solid, Metal Gear, or all the Metal Gear games. And Metal Gear, Metal Gear games are known for these like over the top, cartoon, colorful, memorable mercenaries, larger than life supervillain types with crazy names, Psycho Mantis, and stuff like that. You know, he's going to read your memory card and figure out if you like Sakodin. Now, we definitely have a stat block for that. Uh, it could be an augmented operative, a heavy trooper. Since we're dealing with a corporation that mutates people, I, I'd say definitely an augmented operative. You could even have multiple ones. So maybe he has some heavy troopers as underlings or even soldiers or a mix. But there's at least one augmented operative with like a crazy name, a crazy ability. Just for funsies, I'm going to go to a random Metal Gear Solid name generator. Uh, yeah, Raging Centipede sounds good. Also, I think just to keep things interesting, I believe I'm going to make Bennett a paranormal entity herself. Like maybe she has, you know, stared gaze into the abyss. She's sampled some of the mutagens herself. Uh, or would she also be an augmented operative? She does have the 2D6 laser cannon as is. Um, would that be too difficult? I don't know. I don't really care. I think that works. Yeah, why not? And, you know, if the ritual does go through, that's why you got the enormous monstrosity. Okay, Raging Centipede, what is your deal, my dude? How do you look? Hazmat suit melted onto flesh. Um, 
going to go with white. White hazmat suit melted onto burned black. Flesh, gas mask. What does centipede do here exactly? I know this is uh, Ripley's claim to fame. You have worm-like parasite living inside of you. Okay. Ew. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Um, now, I actually, I haven't used a, a, a fist trait on an enemy operative yet just for one of my adventures. I, I know people do that, though. Um, maybe, I'll just, maybe I'll just add that. I don't think you can. That's not right. Something like that. It'll be gas mask with uh, broken uh, glass goggles. So like something got into this guy's mask. Um, how does he act? Silent, gurgling, relentless. Uh, what does he want? He wants to grapple people and pass the and share the gift of the creature growing inside of him. They can co-parent and secret before the experiments he was super into. They didn't. Yeah. Now, since uh, once again Bennett is kind of doing double duty, uh, we need at least one more NPC. We've got a scientist. We've got a security guard, dude. But what about the poor folks who were rounded up for these experiments? You know, someone to give you like a real nice, like, just a fun, like, kill me, kill me kind of a moment. They're in the glass tube. David. Random last name here. Uh, oh, by the way, I suggest if you're going to use, like, if you're not in a fantasy game and you're using real names, give give all your names a Google. Because, you know, chances are somebody's in, like, you've come up with an NPC name and it's like a dude from One Direction or something. And everyone starts laughing at you at the table. So yeah, just give it a Google. Uh, David Moore, he was, he looks bump, disheveled. Whoops. Spell for me, computer. A uh, jean, a uh, dirty jean jacket over flannel shirt, long hair, thick, Paul Bunyan beard, axe. Pissed off he was taken by CMC. Doesn't trust authority for obvious reasons. Wants to get the hell out of there. Secret is the perfect host for the cosmic horror. Now that could be kind of an interesting little deal. Uh, the party is... Uh, the, party, the, the fist ops are going to... Uh, maybe befriend this guy, maybe talk to him. He's a sympathetic dude. He's understandably agitated about being kidnapped and experimented on. But then they find out that, like, this is the guy. And it's kind of like a zombie transformation kind of a deal. When the two hours are up, he is the doorway. Cool. So, like, do you do you kill him? Do you save him somehow? I don't know. We'll find out. And how how will the ritual be stopped? With any kind of like puzzle or moral quandary or something, I always say like don't feel the need to figure out how your party are going to do it. You cannot possibly anticipate what they're going to do. But it never hurts to like figure out what you were do would do if you were playing. So I think as a player, I would look for some way to like reverse the ritual or make David more like no longer the perfect host. Like, I don't know if that means like cutting off one of his arms or like l looking up in their computer system for, for, for help or something like that. But I think there should be some kind of like way to make him 
or, or in, like in, kind of invalidate the summoning. Uh, hopefully without killing it, because I don't think it's it's cool to like the victory condition probably shouldn't be to kill a random homeless guy. Like that's not cool. He's a young guy. He's had a tough tough life. Uh, be nice to David. He just happens to be host to a cosmic horror. I am kind of lacking like a fun mutant battle. So I'm just going to erase where it says paranormal and write mutants. This is already much longer than I thought it would be. Uh, but, you know, hopefully this will give you an idea of how I prep my adventures. And you can just, you know, as you can see, like I just took like this random table. We've got the, the, the initial brawl. We've got like a couple of ways you can ascend. Scene three probably needs its own setting here. Bubbling glass tanks submerged. So when I'm introducing a scene, I usually like to have uh, like something that invites people to act immediately. And this is a couple of things I think, unless you uh, unless you have like uh, a party full of hackers, they're probably going to ignore the computers. But the bubbling glass tanks with people hooked to tubes, and green fluid, uh, the boulder, and that's kind of like the boulder with a black singe pen prick is kind of like a foreshadowing that there were experiments done with uh, a laser beam on a boulder uh, and very buckaroo bonsai. That's how they're going to like the cosmic horror is inside the boulder. And they've been trying to, to open up like a doorway into the fifth dimension with the laser beam. There is a table with a man, David, strapped to it and like that kind of sets up the scene that like whatever is in the boulder is going to come out or or has come out already um and i think i mean you know this could definitely use more polish i would not release this for, for publishing or anything but i think this is definitely good enough to run right here i've got a couple of solid bad guys i've got like this kind of duplicitous dr newton bennett who just wants to let the the evil run amok. Uh, you've got Raging Centipede, a mutant who's filled with maybe like a lesser, like the son of uh, this cosmic horror. Or, you know, it's it's a little hellboy with the, um, the the dogs that would kind of like lay their eggs and stuff. Like maybe Centipede was like an early attempt and like he couldn't quite fit like the full on cosmic horror, but like he's got like this thing inside of him and he wants to spread it. Mutant security chief, head scientist, maybe not head scientist because then they're going to blame her. Um, uh, junior scientist, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I'm, I'm running out of steam here. And then David or uh, I, I think we're good. I think I think we are good for at least a couple hours of fun and again you can see how we took just these these four rolls and the twist but what didn't i do what did i ignore completely the fact that a late historical figure is somehow alive and involved damn me to hell so cleveland historical figures uh the 10 greatest Clevelanders since 1796. Hey, we're teaching Cleveland digital, everybody. Well, you know, it's seven looks like to me, that looks like a 1d6 roll where I ignore the seventh entry. So let's see what we get. That's a four. And we, we have OP and MJ Van Swearingen. They developed Shaker Heights and Shaker Square when they envisioned a rapid transit system linking the suburb to downtown a railroad line. Blah, 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 the brothers. So they did like a train? A rapid transit system. Okay, so we'll just say that uh, MJ Van Swearingen uh, discovered the the boulder during his excavations for this train line. Um, 
So this is a bit of a change here. We're having so in J Van Swearingen, who is some sort of railroad empire dude. Um, we're just going to say he discovered a boulder covered in runes, and it was the prison of a cosmic entity that promised eternal life in exchange for its release. And then the Swearingen family fortune was secretly funneled into a shitty megacorp whose mission was to unleash the cosmic horror. That means we can get rid of uh, the admittedly iffy, like, will assassinate your rival CEOs thing that I wasn't really into. So, so I was skeptical about the local historical figure, and now I like it. Thank you, Claymore. And there we go. I have I have done it. Um, who is MJ Van Swearingen? And how do they live? Uh, that's up to you, folks. But I'd like to think that MJ... That's right. It's Raging Cedric. Now, this is obviously not everything you'd need. Uh, you know, you could uh, flesh this out a little bit a dozen different ways. I would like to see more general weirdness in the adventure, perhaps something in the lab. I could see there being kind of a, a rooftop set piece where perhaps the, the stone that was uncovered uh, gets sent up stairs. Who knows? And I think I have uh, have accomplished everything I set out to. I could definitely run this. There's a few things I would like to see uh, done to maybe spice it up a little bit. I, I could see like some kind of like a rooftop scenario. You know, if, if you need to pad out the clock a little bit, uh, there could maybe be like some kind of a, like the, the roof of the lab opens up and the, the stone gets raised up into the the, the night sky and maybe uh, some kind of like a phantasmal cosmic entity is, is glimpsed in the clouds or, you know, a little like kaiju in the background. Who knows? With, with the way I run one shots, I tend to kind of improv a little bit of stuff as I go along, but I like to have at least enough planned. So I'm never at a loss for content. And I think that's what we've done. A last thing I think I need is a good name. We've got evil megacorps. We've got um, rail barons who live on as parasitic slugs. We have Cthulhu. We have um, uh, evil security dudes. I don't know. Um, hmm. Maybe vessel, host, something like that. Um, ascent. Let's just go with the host. Uh, and if that makes you want to watch a South Korean movie starring a giant monster, I say go for it. Why did I type shot? The host. All right, there we go. Uh, I think we're good. All right, and that's how easy it is to create a random mission using the tables. And uh, I only had to use outside sources. I really didn't have to use uh, my NPC charts to flesh out that character. You won't. You wouldn't need to. Um, but. Uh, looks like more random tables are all on the way in the new ultra edition which i look forward to uh you can get fist on itch.io um or drive through rpg oh uh before i go one last thing i never know what to do about the format of these scenario walkthrough videos um on one hand i could see folks wanting me to include as much as possible uh, I've I've spent roughly an hour ten real time recording this, and I could see some people being like, "I want to see the full process. Please don't edit it down." On the other hand, I could totally get people being like, "I'm not going to watch some dude create an adventure for an hour. Uh, just sum it up. Give me give me the bullet points, like a ten minute video, fifteen tops. I see pros and cons to each." Maybe 
leave a comment down below and and let me know what you would like to see i almost want to release like both versions of this but that'd be a lot of work for nothing if you would like to see much more streamlined uh walkthroughs where i'm just kind of like hitting the major you know uh bursts of creativity and hitting the highlights just just let me know or if you're cool seeing these mostly unedited walkthroughs that's fine it's probably less work for me that way anyway all right uh until next time i am jamie aka brandoff the off-brand gandalf and this has been whipping up random missions with fist hey see you next time